This show is part of the RetroZap.com podcast network. Today's show is brought to you by T Public. Head to the Animaniacast T Public store by going to tpublic.animaniacast.com. Check out a selection of Animaniacs, Tiny Tunes, Pinky and the Brain, Freakazoid, and other designs selected by the hosts of the Animaniacast. Every purchase supports an independent artist and this podcast. It's a win win situation. So head on over to tpublic.animaniacast.com today. Hey, this is Tom Ruger, and you're listening to the Animaniacast. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another special episode of the Animaniacast. Did you guys know that Animaniacs actually just turned 26 last week? What? I know it's insane. So, what we decided to do was bring on our friend and one of our favorite guests. It's Mr. Tom Ruger. That's right, the creator of Animaniacs himself. And he's going to be discussing episodes 11 through 20 of the series with us. Um, We actually ended up getting so carried away with our conversation that we actually decided to split this episode into two parts. So despite what you're going to hear me say in a few moments, we will only be discussing episodes 11 through 15 today. But make sure to tune in to our next episode for part two, where we will be discussing episodes 16 through 20? Question mark? Maybe? (laughs) Well, you're just going to have to find out uh, in our next episode. But for right now, let's just go ahead and get on with the show. And welcome, everybody, to a special episode of the Animaniacast. I'm very busy trying to discover a new style. Please go away. So we should go. Oui, oui. Pardon? Oui, oui. Ugh, the stuff they're getting away with on kids' shows these days. And welcome once again to the Animaniacast. This is the only podcast out there that's dedicated to the animated television series, Animaniacs, as well as, you know, Pinky and the Brain, Tiny Toon Adventures, and Freakazoid. But today, we are talking about episodes 11 through 20 of Animaniacs. And we have a very special guest with us as well. But before I get to him, let me introduce... My co-hosts in California, it's my brother Nathan. Hello, lady in the tree. (laughs) Across the country in Georgia, it's Kelly. Hi there. And joining us once again is the man, the myth, and the creator of Animaniacs himself. It's Mr. Tom Ruger. Hello, nurses. Hello, hello. Yes, we are. This is our back for our part two of our, our special series where we basically take 10 episodes of Animaniacs and uh, talk about it for as long as people will listen to us talk about it. <laughs> <laughs> but we also get some behind the scenes news and uh, information about these episodes that you, you won't get anywhere else because Tom knows it all. He knows it all. So <laughs> luckily. <laughs> He's back with us today. So, Tom, thank you for being on the show once again. Well, I, I always enjoy it, so uh, uh, I think we'll have fun today. I, I watched uh, all ten half hours uh, last night and today, and uh, boy, this is a good batch. I mm-hmm. agree. I agree. I was able to 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 watch a, a bunch of them as well. I think I got all the way. I got. I, yes, I got all the way through, all the way through episode 10, the, the 20th, I should say. The 20th episode is sitting up on my DVD player on my screen. So well, I, the 20th episode, of course, is uh, uh, controversial because sometimes the, 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 the numbers are wrong on some of these episodes. But uh, I think of it as the Hearts of Twilight episode, which is uh, a, just a classic and probably deserves its own episode sometime or, or its own animani cast episode. Well, I yeah. with yeah, with Tom Ruger. And yes. pa- uh, Paul on there too, I think. Yes. 
I think so. <laughs> it's, it's so funny. It's such a great app. Well, that'll be our f- grand finale for today's discussion. But let's go ahead and start way at the beginning of well today's episode. And <laughs> <laughs> let's start all the way at episode 11. And Kelly, why don't you tell us what segments did we have here in episode 11? In episode 11, we had no pain, no no painting, lay miseranimals. Aha. So a very artistic episode. We were going off to France, I believe, in this one, if I'm not mistaken. Mm-hmm. Yes, it's almost all uh, in Paris or right outside of Paris. So we had a Pablo Picasso in No Pain, No Painting. Uh, this is another one of these ones, uh, of course, where the, the Warners are going off to to harass and inspire <laughs> an artist. Uh, what can you tell us here about No Pain, No Painting, Tom? Well, I, I like that the episode begins with, uh, rather than, um, here's the show's name, it's How Urbane, very <laughs> urbane. It's classic. Uh, yes. Um, and also, uh, the Warners escape by a giant soap bubble from the water tower to uh, get over to France. And not only to get over to France, but to go to another time zone, uh, another period in history, actually. <laughs> so that's a pretty good soap bubble. Uh, uh, this one, No Pain, No Painting, written by uh, Peter Hastings, directed by Alfred Germano and Dave Marshall. And uh, Alfred was, of course, uh, out here in L.A., but Dave Marshall was our man. And you see his name on a bunch of episodes as a director. He was our man at Cuckoo's Nest. So every time you see Dave Marshall's name, you know that it's been animated and drawn at Wang Film Cuckoo's Nest in uh, Taipei. And Dave did so much great work on uh, making these episodes so beautiful that uh, we would often give him uh, uh, a joint uh, directing credit. Uh, He really... uh, as our overseas supervisor at Cuckoo's Nest, he was uh, instrumental in making good episodes. Uh, one of the things I noticed when watching this thing, there's a very early, in the episode, there's a very early cameo of Jackie Gleason from the movie Gijot, G-I-G-O-T, 1962. He's the guy on a bike that passes by camera very early in the episode, and it's a caricature of Jackie Gleason in, uh, from like one of the worst movies ever. Well, is really, really kind of unwatchable. I'm glad you you pointed that out because I wrote that down. And I think we talked about that originally. That I was like, "Who's this Jackie Gleason looking guy?" And I had to look up on Google Jackie Gleason France and saw <laughs> that's right, Gijo. And you are a good, uh, you're a good investigator. That's exactly right. So and, a bad movie. Uh, yeah, not well. It's just uh, he's playing. Uh, just a challenged guy so it's really kind of uh, very uh, sentimental and uh, kind of unwatchable <laughs> Here, in this one I've noticed and as you guys know knowing all the Animaniac episodes and having seen them all we have certain adversaries that the Warners go against some of them are sort of sympathetic like Einstein and Cookies for Einstein is kind of he's kind of a nice guy but he's sort of you know he can't quite pull it together and they're, they're helpful then there are guys like uh, the guy at the candy store, the guy in the airplane, and Picasso here, and even Beethoven. But Picasso, he's kind of a jerk. Mm-hmm. And uh, I'm not so sure that was fair. I mean, Stradivarius we have later, he's a total jerk, too. Um, <laughs> so I think we maybe weren't being very kind <laughs> to these characters. I mean, they all seem very self-obsessed and, and concerned about their own issues and you know, and the Warner just get out of here. You know, he's just trying to get rid of the Warners. But uh, I think this is a particularly funny app because I think uh, Peter and, and Alfred brought so many uh, clever sort of visual ideas and historically valid uh, uh, comical comments about Picasso and his art. And uh, I just thought it, it really held together. And of course, we have the Warners being. Their, their typical selves, and they notice that he has the letters P and P, you know, his Pablo Picasso initials on his smock, and they keep referring to that as PP on his smock. Did you know there's PP on your smock? Yee, disgusting! This stands for Pablo Picasso! Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
But there's great material in here. There's the dogs playing poker, the, the famous, uh, I think, uh, CM Coolidge uh, dogs playing poker image and that uh, Picasso is trying to get that on canvas and he just can't do it. He's, he's been through his rose period, he's been through his blue period and uh, then he gets talked into playing P Pictionary basically with the Warners and uh, he has to draw a guitar, he has to draw a Mount Rushmore and the Warners draw this stuff just primitively like kids would, just really uh, bizarre looking uh, drawings of Mount Rushmore and a, a guitar and they are very much Picasso-esque, while Picasso draws a perfect guitar. So uh, it, this cartoon claims, and I think it's all true, that the <laughs> Warners led Picasso to his most successful surrealist Cubist period. Uh, and I just think the, the cartoon's very funny. Well, he paid them in francs, though, too. So that's good that he is, he is compensating them for all their work. That's right. Yakko had uh, the beans and... Uh, <laughs> And Dot had the buns, so uh, <laughs> they got francs out of it. Please, will you go away if I give you some francs? I got the beans. I got the ketchup. I got the buns. Says you. Well, um, I, one of the things I noticed when I was watching this episode the other day was the fact that the music itself is very prevalent. And uh, uh, one of the things I, I noticed whenever, whenever I rewatch these episodes, I'll start paying attention to just the orchestration. And there's that part where they're playing Pictionary, and when Pablo draws the perfect guitar, the the woodwinds and are playing, and the flute is playing, and it sounds perfect. And then Yakko or you know draws it again in his crooked version, and then the same tune is played, but it's twisted and bent, and it has it's just it's this it's just beautiful how, it, how the little details like that. I can't believe it! It's a guitar! A guitar! The neck, the strings, a guitar! That's a guitar. What? That's ridiculous! It's hideous and old bent! A guitar? That's the brilliance of Richard Stone and uh, Steve and Julie Bernstein. They, they brought so much beautiful uh, thinking and, and brilliant music to it. Um, the first... Uh, the drawing of Mount Rushmore that ya Wacko uh, first draws, which has the guy with a big nose, that and then that turns into a painting we see on the wall at a gallery. That's a Picasso painting. That is actually a Picasso-esque caricature of Rich Aaron's, our producer. Yes, I thought that was Ringo Starr the first time we watched it. I couldn't tell because that <laughs> nose was so big, but. As soon as I, I saw that it was Rich Aarons, I looked him up. I was like, oh, yeah, that's definitely Rich. <laughs> that's definitely him. Keep up the good work, mes amis. We get paid in francs. Well, then there's Les Miserables. Well, yeah, th this, is, uh, this was a big production. Um, uh, I had seen Les Mis and loved it and asked Deanna, who uh, is one of the most brilliant uh, improv singers of, on earth. I mean, if you've ever been to improv and people just making up songs on the spot, well, the best I've ever seen is Deanna Oliver, whose lyrics are always hilarious. So uh, I said, Deanna, we want to do a parody of Les Mis with Rita and Runt. She said, I'm on it. And she came up with this entire thing with... Uh, all the songs, beautiful songs, and, and uh, very funny plot, and the uh, bitten on the butt, and there's all sorts <laughs> of funny bits in it. And uh, she handed it in, and we recorded it, and uh, of course, we all know it's a very successful, beautiful cartoon. Matter of fact, the guys that uh, made the Warner Brothers uh, feature animation division um, uh, they made a movie about Camelot, where I think with Eric Idle's voice was in it, but it was an animated film. And uh, they basically based the production on uh, our cartoon, <laughs> Deanna's cartoon, because they just thought it was just like a perfect kind of comedy cartoon. Uh, so anyway, after it was done, Deanna came to me and says, oh, by the way, I've never seen Les Mis. <laughs> <laughs> That's wow. how good she is. That's how good she is. She's never seen it. Wow. Uh, 
But Jeff Bennett is uh, does his great John Cleese voice, uh, his French John Cleese, specifically from Monty Python and the Holy Grail. Uh, that's Jeff Bennett doing that. Britain in the butt, got an for tear, took a little nibble from a dairy air. I will get you in the end, dog. You'll regret you bit me, chum. Oh, I am so irritated, I get bitten in the bum. Um, let's see. What else is there about Les Mis? How about you guys? What are your thoughts about Les Mis? Well, let's go with Kelly, because I know that's one of your favorite oh, ones. Yeah, I, I think I've seen it four or five times on the stage. I I love it, and I've read the whole book, Unabridged. So, so I, compared, my favorite. So with the cartoon, then, I mean, like, like it compares pretty well. Don't you think the, I think we went to, like, song-by-song song comparison the first time we talked mm-hmm. about it. And you could really pinpoint, like, here's the parody here and there. And it's it's just fantastic. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> and also, even Deanna's uh, ad-libs are funny. Save us, God. Uh, looks like we're going to be eaten by a Sweeney Todd. Or <laughs> Yeah. Uh, and I love Rita in it. She was uh, Bernadette Peters' beautiful song, There's a Flat in Gay Paris. It's gorgeous. Starlight. Star bright, I wish I was any place but this. There is a flat in Gay Paris, safe on a tree lined avenue. No cats a la carte on the menu. Not in my flat in Gay Paris. There is a chef of fine cuisine. He is a vegetarian. As he prepares a fine banquet, he says, Rita, you're my my beloved pet. I know a flat where I can nap, safe on a chair or in a lap. I won't end up in a recipe, not in my flat in And Frank Welker, the voice of Runt. Now, Frank is not a singer, per se, but he does a great job singing Runt. <laughs> I'm Runt, the Runt. Mm-hmm. Uh, Definitely. Uh, <laughs> okay, must have, uh, uh, the pain will go away. Read his line. The pain will go away soon. He must have... Uh, confuse me for a cartoon. <laughs> yes, <Very funny. laughs> there. Yeah, that's that's one of the few times where Rita is actually you. You see her getting through some physical abuse right there. I think there was this part right. She gets her tail stretched out. Uh, yeah, uh, and then of course there was that the gorilla one, which we'll eventually Kiki's get to. Kiki's kitten. Kiki's I think. kitten. Yeah. So, th- but yeah. <laughs> It breaks the fourth wall there with that yeah. reference to the cartoon. <laughs> and then I just wrote these down because I love it. Do you hear the poodle's bark, barking the bark of angry mutts? It is the high-pitched yap of angry <laughs> mutts whose mouths will not be shut. I mean, it's great. <laughs> we will tear down the prison wall. We will destroy the restaurant. We are revolting poodles following Runt Val Runt. <laughs> really, Mrs. Mizzle- Free, they miss their animals. Free, definitely, <laughs> definitely free them. Uh, just beautiful. Uh, Frank Welker just really stepping up. Uh, and then there's something I don't think I've, I know we've never done anywhere else in any cartoon that uh, we made on, on Animaniacs, where I think the term is contrapuntal, where two people are singing at the same time. I love that part. Going around each other, and you can hear both sets of lyrics, they're a little different. And they're singing two different melodies, two different songs uh, with Runt, uh, Frank Welker doing this, uh, and against uh, the, the evil dog. Beautiful. The Runt, you care, there's no escaping me. Ha ha, ho ho, ha ha ha, he he. But I quote this, I'm an innocent stray. Confess, Kim and Bear, you know what's true. A I did like not steal that bone, it was you. Like you. It's a tight musical too. I don't. Is this, is this just a one segment? Or am, I, am I not looking at? Yeah, that? it's just one quick little thing. It's not. It's not separated with a commercial break or anything like that. I don't and think so. Is, it's there, just there, isn't a, there isn't a wasted moment in it. Uh, there really isn't. And it. 
I will tell you, it looks like it was more expensive than many other segments in our show. And I will tell you, it was. <laughs> <laughs> Matter like, of fact, I got called in uh, on the carpet, so to speak, uh, on this one. I said, so you guys, you're not going to really make a lot of these types of cartoons, right? Where it's, <laughs> it's like really, uh, you get 50 characters and yeah. uh, you got a lot of singing and lip Anyway, I said, well, no, we'll do it now and then. Yeah, not yeah. until the next episode. To Paris? To Paris! At the end of the road is a city of Paris. At the end of the road is a city of light. The city of romance. We'll be drinking merry and dance. And with any luck at all of our children tonight, give it a pass. Let's move on to episode 12. Great. Okay, episode 12. Uh, features Garage Sale of the Century and another musical, West Side Pigeons. <laughs> so let's let's start off a, 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 a talk here about Garage Sale of the Century. Right, but these just for the for the record, these are two back to back half hours that show off uh, Deanna Oliver writing these crazy musicals. Deanna hadn't been featured in, in the first ten episodes much, but she's coming on strong in uh, these two back to back half hours. Absolutely. Garage Sale of the Century was, of course, Ed Asner as the, I think, unnamed character of Vern. Uh, I saw in the credits we called him Vern, but I always thought of him as the, the bear homeowner who was ripping off his neighbors uh, selling junk. And this, cart- this cartoon, this whole sort of yard sale where people were getting ripped off, this was uh, based on, uh, <laughs> and I love my brothers, they're great, but my brother Pete, who was five years older than I, he would uh, every year, like in summertime, he, he would want some, <laughs> want some money. He would like need some money to go do something. So he would go into his junk drawer in his little desk at home and pull out all that junk and crap that he didn't want anymore. And he would gather all the little neighborhood kids, me being one of them that were younger than he and easily, easily uh, influenced by him. And he would auction off all his crap. <laughs> and uh, we would, oh, yeah, I want that broken flashlight. I want this. You know. And most of it didn't work. It was junk. But uh, we wanted it because he was an older guy. So <laughs> that, that's sort of what Vern is doing. He's really getting rid of his junk. This one, this one is beautifully surreal in that uh, at one point, Wacko gets hold of uh, the guy's garage clicker. And... Uh, it operates in Wacko's hand. It get, it's broken, so but Racco, Wacko gets it working again, but it doesn't work correctly. It works surreally now, so that the garage like flips over now. Instead of ri- instead of the door rising, the garage flips over, and uh, and it makes uh, he aims it at some people, and they kind of go upside down for a moment. And then later, these two beautiful girls who are uh, designed like uh, Dickie Moore Disney uh, young women drawings. And uh, <laughs> they go by and Wacko sees how pretty they are and he aims the remote at them and <laughs> and Dot grabs out of his hand. That's enough, that's enough out of you. Uh, so anyway, um, uh, this is, this is a, a fun episode. It's uh, animated by TMS and... We usually try to give TMS the more complicated things, like uh, like uh, Les Mis or Animals. This was sort of we were giving them uh, after Les Mis. We gave them kind of a, an easier one, which is just a few characters to deal with. Uh, there's a caricature of Nick Hollander in this one, uh, where he wants his money back. He's voiced by Rob Paulson, but he's a he's a customer, and it's definitely a drawing of Nick. Um, and so anyway, yeah. There's some other cameos too. You got like Buster and Babs and Dizzy Devil and even Batman is running to get his money back, I think, at the end. So if you look oh, yeah. carefully. Yeah, Batman's in the crowd. I didn't know that big crowd, that giant it's, down. Angle. You have to pause it to look at any of those people though. Yeah. Like, <laughs> but this just shows you the, like, the little details and everything. Like even in a, a you know, quote unquote simple episode, something like this, you know, there, there's still that all that detail if you really look at it to... Easter eggs, as it were. Um, and uh, also, Rob Paulson does a great his great uh, Pat Buttram impression. Right, I love that. <laughs> 
May I help you? Warner's the name. Auctions are my game. See, this is a nice garage. I can get you top dollar for it. Top dollar. What? Yes, sir, Reed Bob. We'll auction it off to the highest bidder. Lots of money. Ooh, you'll be rich, I tell you. Rich. <laughs> what do you say? I don't think. Good man. I'll start the bidding at 25 cents. 25 cents? 25 cents. 25. Do I hear 26? 26 cents. 26. Do I hear 27? 27 cents. 27 cents. 27 cents. Going once, twice. Sold. Ooh, you're a lucky man. You. Who? Oh. Get out of here. Is this Was this your first time working with Ed Asner in this episode? I think so. And, of course, we, we then claimed him for Freakazoid uh, as uh, our police guy. And he was, you know... Uh, really crucial to Freakazoid because he was Freakazoid's best pal, and they, they shared interests in the same stupid things. <laughs> okay, and then now let's go ahead and move on to West Side Pigeons. Yeah, and here we had uh, early on in the in the production process. I, I'm the first things I ever wrote and did on Animaniacs were these simple little wraparounds. Sort of like, uh, it would be like a Newsreel of the Stars was like one of the first things I wrote. And the, the main title, and then these little little tiny bits that we'd use, like uh, Wacko as a projector. And and this this one, I noticed we've used it only this once, which is, uh, let's read our fortunes. I think it's only used once. And, uh, you know, Dot's fortune is you're incredibly cute or something to that effect. And... Uh, I know Wacko's fortune doesn't get a fortune. He says, "Well, what is it if it's not a fortune? It's the next cartoon." And he leans into camera, and that's where West Side Pigeons uh, comes out of that. Very again, this is very Rocky yeah. and Bullwinkly, right there. Oh yeah, mm-hmm. definitely. Is it an important message? It sure is. Just listen. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Hi, Animaniacs podcast. This is Chick Venera as Pesto the Pigeon. That's a mouthful. Why would you do that to someone? Why? Okay, that's it. I'm out of here. West Side Pigeon, uh, written by Deanna, directed by Barry Caldwell, Dave Marshall over at Cuckoo's Nest, and Greg Reyna. Now, Greg was really uh, our West, our, our Good Feathers specialist, Greg was. And uh, also, I've been watching some of Greg's work uh, through Animaniacs, and in almost every episode he directs, there's a moving background shot, which are really difficult and really challenging so he always wanted to rise to that occasion and so it, you have the characters maybe walking but then you'll see the buildings literally animating not panning away but animating behind them and it's just a much more difficult shot to uh to include now I, i'm really interested in seeing if this holds up against steven spielberg's new west side story movie <laughs> <laughs> and a matter of fact animani cast uh when that movie is about to come out, we have to get uh, this one uh, out there uh, uh, online so that people can can judge the two. Yes, I think we need to <laughs> go there for yourself. Yeah, we need to have a deep dive into West Side Pigeons. <laughs> yes, and uh, talk about it again. And, uh, and and I think I think Spielberg was rewatching old Animaniacs episodes and just said, <laughs> you know what? Yeah, I should oh, go. there's an idea for a movie. You know, hey, is, well, let's get the rights to that. Um, <laughs> You know, this one, again, with Deanna's lyrics, you know, we want to perch on Scorsese's head. Why can't we perch on Scorsese's head? Good fellow, perch on Scorsese's head. We want to perch on Scorsese's head. Uh, Krupp Kitty, um, who uh, doesn't enjoy eating a a color tura. I mean, just (laughs) Deanna's wit. uh, Her jokes are over my head usually, uh, but they they are clever and it's funny they 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 absolutely work uh and her parody of west side story here is just hilarious we want to stay here on the rooftop we don't we'd like to purchase corsese's head why can't we purchase corsese's head good feathers purchase corsese's head sparrow should purchase corsese's head on the rooftop we get lots of sunshine no one to perch on a clothesline up here we have a boy's eye view humans drop food by the statue we'd like to perch on scorsese's head why can't we perch on scorsese's head good feathers perch on scorsese's head we're gonna perch on scorsese's head uh 
the Carluda song by Squid. Again, Maurice LaMarche is not, you know, he's not Tony Bennett, but he's not Frank Sinatra, but he does a great job. You know, Carluta, I love you. I love you back. <laughs> Carluda, meet me at the Scorsese statue around 1043. Why wait? We'll migrate tonight. Okay. Oh, Carluda. Carluta, I just met a bird named Carluta. And please don't think me rude, but I think I'd like to brood with Carluta. Carluta, Carluta. I got to cut down on my coloratura. So I, I, I think the songs were great. Uh, I just think her word choice was really clever. You know, uh, where uh, I don't hope I'm not being rude, but I think I'd like to brood with Carluda. Uh, <laughs> I feel feathery, which is uh, the the lightest that the uh, the three good feathers have ever become. I think, <laughs> uh, uh, but I, a beautiful uh, a beautiful musical uh, situation here. And the god pigeon's funny when he comes in and he invites them to go to a, a car lot and they're going to play poo poo bombardier on a. I love pool. that. <laughs> yeah, that was the only time. I I might be mistaken, but that might be the only time we were actually got captioning on the good god pigeon as well. I think. Yes, captioning on him, and uh, uh, and then then we got uh, captioning on uh, another cartoon that's coming up in this episode. I think where, where they're actually moving the captions uh, around. Oh yes, that's coming up in just a couple, I believe. So yeah, yes. <laughs> so uh, just a few people. Uh, the sheet timing was done by Max Beecraft, who is a, a colleague of mine with whom I, I started in the business at Hanna-Barbera with him, in the same sort of uh, assistant animation unit. Dan McHugh by now is doing all the backgrounds or the lead background. He's drawing all the backgrounds. And, uh, of course, uh, Brian Seaburn and Captain Yelzer are painting all the backgrounds. And Rusty Mills is doing all the title cards. So every one of those title cards that we see for, you know, like, when it says Les Miser Animals, every one of them is done by the incredibly talented Rusty Mills. Oh, well, yeah, and it, it really does have just a fantastic movement and everything. Like the, just the, when they're going down the, the beginning of the episode and they're snapping their fingers or their feathers or whatever and, and doing the dance moves and uh, like the jets or whatever. It was just – it's just really impressive stuff. And And – that particular moment where they they cut they create these beautiful shapes where they're going sideways and they're they have real attitude uh there's another great uh exit that uh squit makes when he's going to chase the beautiful bird at the very end where he, he really goes into a groucho marx crouch and pursues <laughs> well nathan um i guess let's move right over to episode 13 what do we got next okay all right, so we got a lot of firsts. We have Hello Nice Warners, which is our first Mr. Director. We have La Behemoth, which is our first full Hip Hippos, and Little Old Slappy from Pasadena, which is the first driving of Slappy. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> first time we saw dra- Slappy in a car. Yeah. Actually, I think it's our first record drop. Uh, yeah, that's true. It really is, because uh, we, we didn't do many of those. Uh, yeah, Hello Nice Warners. Um, the hills are quite full with big rocks and boulders. Yeah. <laughs> that that doesn't that make you think that Paul Rugg is writing the lyrics? It it really does. I just know that just, that's got Paul Rugg written all over. I, it. I've noticed that Paul has a, a an affinity for the sound of music and a lot of his stuff on. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He likes uh, he likes Gilbert and Sullivan. He, uh-huh. he, he really is. Uh, Definitely uh, deep dive into the sound of music. Which is, Gilbert and Sullivan is also in this episode, too. They do the three little maids from school, are we? You know, he's, yep. he's, he's like, let's check off the things that Paul likes. Uh, and, and, of course, Jerry Lewis. <laughs> let's put these three things in an episode, and then you get, oh, hello, there's Nice a, Warners. There's a line in this one that uh, I just find so funny, and it works. It probably worked. Back in 1993, for like three percent of the audience, right? 
of the adult audience, like maybe 10% of the adult audience, and I don't know how big that was, in 1993 could maybe not laugh at this joke, but it could have understand it. But now, uh, I can't imagine the number of people that even remotely know it. But at one point, the kids, oh, I love you kids. And they're like backing away. Says, we we got to go. We, we're going to Jan Murray's house. Yeah. Where are you nutty funds just going? Jan Murray's house? Now, Jan Murray was really, uh, he was like a Catskill comic. And he was on TV when I was a kid. So we're talking about, you know, 55 years ago. And uh, I, I suspect uh, people are not remembering Jan Murray. He, 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 he was funny, but it not, not uh, he was sort of like, you know, there's a group of comics that were tight and were close, sort of like Walter Wolf, Beanie the Brain Dead Bison, and Sid the Squid, uh, comics that hang out together. So Jan Murray would hang out with Milton Berle and, and Jack Carter and different comics, but... Just that, that Yakko, Wacko, and Dot are being characters that existed in 1930. They know all these characters, so I, I love that they make <laughs> reference. I also like in this one, there's a visual that's fabulous, where the three Warners are screaming t in terror. They want to get out. And it's a drawing I've never seen in any other cartoon. It might exist, but... It's, their, their, their faces are lifted up and they have these weird little mouths that look, they make them look like they're uh, possums. Okay. Yeah, they're just screaming and they look sort of like the possums from uh, Buster and Babs' uh, uh, summer vacation section. To me, they look anyway. like jaws or something. They have yes, weird... <laughs> that's right. Little jaws. That's right. The jaws of, uh, they have little sharp teeth. Yeah. <laughs> This one has, I think, this may be the first time Yakko did a courtesy laugh. And I think it's the yeah. only time they went into a Stanislavski moment. Which, <laughs> again, the kids love those Stanislavski moments. <laughs> <laughs> but they were copying him. And Yakko did his sort of copying, uh, making fun of him. The copycat thing was just like a bit that we had in our series Bible. Oh, Wacko does copycat stuff like Chevy Chase, you know. And uh, so it's in here. Uh, we didn't do it a lot. We did it in maybe three or four episodes, and it's, it's in this one. Uh, but Rug really brought his whole Jerry Lewis uh, characterization to bear on this one. I mean, where the Warners picked up on it, and they said, do it like that, and they just go around screaming, nice lady, nice lady, nice lady. Oh, just insane. Don't with the hitting. I'll make it should fit. See, now that's funny. You kids do it just like that. All right, Morty, roll it. Action. Oh, lady, oh, lady, oh, lady, oh, lady, oh, lady, oh, lady, oh, lady. Nice lady. And then, and then Jerry, the tables turn, and Mr. Director is uh, on the receiving end of directing uh, from Yakko using a megaphone, and, he, and it, it's very loud, and he, please make with the whisper. <laughs> 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 and then, uh, of course, there's the classic old Screamer episode where, <laughs> Wack <laughs> where Wacko uh, has to put his, euthanize his pet, played by uh, Mr. Director in a dog suit, and he doesn't want to do it. And then Dot, being the cutest mother on earth, says, don't you worry, I got you a little puppy. And, uh, and <laughs> Wacko just turns, bye, old streamer. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no bark. Woof. No. But Ma, how will I ever live without old screamer? Yeah, bark. Because I bought you this new cuddly puppy. <laughs> Oh, a cute little puppy. Goodbye, old screamer. Ow, bark height. Very, very, uh, I mean, this is one of Rugg's uh, funniest, uh, just a brilliant, bril brilliantly written cartoon. Uh, and the way he performs Mr. Director... Uh, oh, monster with teeth and paws. I mean, just crazy stuff. <laughs> well, 
Well, we also have the Indiana Jones uh, parody at the end, too. Illinois Smith. Yeah. Whip, whip, whip. Whip, whip. This whip is not working. (laughs) Whenever he does Jerry uh, Rug, it it turns into Yoda speak. It's all like (laughs) the words are all inverted and backwards. Maybe that's why I like it so much. Yeah, I think that might explain something. Explains a lot. (laughs) I have to go. I I gotta leave. Shouldn't, yes, to go. Maybe we shouldn't work together. You're good, but not for me to work. I should go. Leave, I should. Why I go? Are you sure? Oh, yeah. Going is good. Staying is bad. Bye. That man is a genius. Then we go to the the hip hippos right here. So let's... uh, La, La Behemoth. Now you see, I, I've been away from the show for many years, and I, I, uh, so I really enjoyed watching these. I wish I had watched the whole batch uh, when we spoke about the first ten. I'd like to probably talk about them again someday. But this one, uh, Hip Hippos. Uh, this was not the first Hip Hippos written. Right. The first Hip Hippos written was Moving Experience, written by Peter Hastings. This uh, is showing up before moving experience. And, and the reason is, is because we made these shows. Uh, I had all the episodes and cards on the wall. And, and on each card was the length of the episode. And I knew I had 22 minutes to fill. And so, uh, you know, if I needed a six-minute cartoon, because I had, uh, you know, 15, 16 minutes done already, uh, and there is a six-minute cartoon, I would grab it. So Hip Hippos, uh, La Behemoth was ready, as was the other one, but here we had this really um, great cartoon to match it up with, and uh, and this was, of course, uh, again, one of those big musical numbers. In this one, we actually hired famous, uh, you know, accomplished opera singers to play these roles. Uh, because Frank and Tress didn't need to sing opera. They didn't need that. Yeah. Uh, anyway, so Nick Hollander wrote this, and he's from a very musical, brilliant musical family. His father was the uh, concert master of the NBC Orchestra throughout the 40s, and 50s, uh, which means he's the, the lead violinist, and basically the whole orchestra kind of follows his lead. Uh, and, and Nick's brother was uh, the star of... Uh, piano rag that we made right uh, remember that one so um so nick wrote this he wrote all the the songs and uh, of course richard and and the, the bernsteins did all the music so uh, i thought it it showed the hip hop was probably a, as well as they've ever been shown and uh and it wasn't intended to be their premiere but they they're, they first showed up in the monkey song uh in the first episode but uh, they didn't have much to do in that. So here they're really, they're wailing because their servant has uh, gone away and what are they going to do? <laughs> so it's really uh, definitely a first word, a first world problem for them. And they are uh, the most selfish, uh, actually kind of loathsome characters in the whole series. And <laughs> they really I are, think it, but you know. Yeah, I think it's great we did very little with them. Yes. <laughs> Marita, 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 what shall we do? What will become of us two? The help is gone, the maid is true. What will become of us two? Uh-oh, now who'll clean our cages? Uh, well, uh, and then we're going on to uh, Jan and Dean's song right here, a little... Lady from Pasadena turns into little Slappy from Pasadena. Right, but the the words the the, the record is really a record drop. It's the little lady from Pasadena, right? Mm-hmm. Yes. And uh, we just said that the cartoon was called uh, a little Slappy, but it's Slappy driving around in a fast car, uh, carved together by uh, Tom Minton, who's a, a brilliant brilliant writer. I would say that this was. Uh, 
you know, uh, in the whole scheme of Slappy, it's it's not that interesting uh, a story. You know what I mean? Yeah, it it, it was cute. I it was, I do remember it a lot as a kid, though. I remember seeing it, and I just liked the song as a kid, and it was nice mm-hmm. to see it. So, you know, as as ways to you know take up a couple minutes, I think it it's can't go wrong. Right? Fun animation yet, to it. Yeah. And yet it's uh, you know and listen, I, I I'm not my goal here is not to uh, downgrade or, or critique or negatively critique these shows, but it's really not. Uh, the ending isn't Slappy mm. because Slappy gets called off by police at the end, which she doesn't let that happen. <laughs> that's, not something, that's not something that's going to happen to her. She's going to go in the tree and, and, and lock the doors and they're not coming in. That's when the it, that's when the second part of the episode should have picked up. And then you yeah, see her I, like on the live uh, L.A. Uh, feed right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, police chase. Yeah, one of those. That, exactly. They see that would have been great. That's probably the way we should have gone there. It should have been like OJ. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, let's go ahead and get into episode. Uh, this is episode thirteen. No, fourteen. Let's get into episode fourteen. And Kelly, what segments are featured in this one? We have La La Law and Cat on a Hot Steel Beam. Yes, yes. Um, so this one, and I don't know if there are other episodes exactly like this, but the opening of episode 14, uh, and I, I think there might be one other in the whole scheme of 99 episodes, but this is my preferred opening for the show, which is Newsreel of the Stars and... There's not a fade out on Newsreel of the Stars. It goes black and white and the end of the, of the tower at the end of Newsreel of the Stars. And then it literally, we zoom in on the, the, the tower from our main title and there's no cut. So it's, it's no fade out. It's Newsreel of the Stars and then it's time for eh, and, it, and it's a beautiful, perfect match. And why we didn't use this more... I don't know, because every time we use Newsreel the Stars, we should have done this, and we didn't. But I love this this connection. Yeah, I think we agree. Mm-hmm. I think we had that yeah, exact conversation. We talked about it on the show. We're like, we're tired of Newsreel the Stars, but actually, this was so much better <laughs> just That's to have right. it this way. Like <laughs> when, when Newsreel the Stars is on there, it should be with, with this connection. Yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. Uh, I must have listened to your show. <laughs> Publicly, the studio has disavowed any knowledge of the Warner's existence to this very day when the Warner's escaped. It's time for Animaniacs, and to the max. So back now, oh, this one has mind time in it. Is this the first mind time? I don't know if it is. I, I think, think so. it is, yeah. Yeah. Today on Mime Time. Trapped in an imaginary box. The end. That that, yeah, that worked. And then uh, then we have La La La, uh, as Kelly pointed out. Uh, this was uh, directed by Mike Gerard and, and Rich Aarons, and there's Paul Rugg uh, writing. And... Uh, I love uh, the beginning where Scratch and Sniff is coming out of a, a, a store, and it's the store is Freud's psychoanalysis shop, and there's a, a sale on psychiatric couches. Yes, it's a blowout sale, and uh, just just weirdness. And so he's carrying this couch down the street, and he's got a gets a parking ticket, and uh, now. This is totally obscure, but uh, Nathan probably knows about this. But in Burbank, there are no parking meters. So oh. that's that's a, that's an error in this cartoon because <laughs> because Scratchy he gets a, a parking meter ticket in Burbank, and that's the one of the beautiful things about Burbank. There are no parking meters. There's like two hour parking everywhere. As long as you're moving in two hours, you're okay. Anyway, uh, 
So he was right to fight it. He was right to contest this parking ticket. Yeah. <laughs> he should have. He should, should have brought that up. But uh, they, they had a whole parking meter. They had a parking meter made and a parking uh, a courtroom. So we just should have changed it to Woodland Hills, but we didn't. Um, I love the the bit with Wacko is a Xerox machine. I thought that was wonderful. It, um, it is a very I, I put when I, when I was watching it, I said this is a very punny episode. There's the shadow of a dot, and even the, the it was total puns. Yeah, yeah, the the judge, in fact, is is tr- really trying to to go against this, and he uh, hates puns. Yes, he hates these puns. One more pun like that, and I'll find you in contempt. Oh, I've never been to contempt. Isn't that in New Mexico? Him yoga? Do they have bats there? Do they suck blood? You kids are driving me crazy! I wonder what prison is like. There's, of course, the penal code. The peony the witness, yes. The peony the witness witness and and the penal code. Yes. (laughs) And uh, good night, everybody. Yeah, they... they, (laughs) And I, I love the uh, again another rug little little stroke where uh, the meter maid's name is Gertie Bilch Moitner. <laughs> I mean, what kind of a name? Or uh, oh, and she's not Nana Puntridge. Uh, she does, she doesn't know Nana Puntridge. I and mean, just the funny names he throws in. Uh, yep, the penal code. Uh, you know, they, they get a, they wind up asking uh, Dot and. and and Wacko go up and ask the witnesses questions like, do you have any candy? <laughs> That's not a very helpful question. Also, the, uh, the, the mime, of course, gets pulled in as their silent partner at their law firm, which I thought was very funny. <laughs> Miss Bilchmoidner, why did you give Dr. Scratch and Sniff a ticket? His parking meter had expired. That's a violation of the Burbank Penal Code. The what? The Penal Code! The Penal Code! <laughs> You know, the two of you ought to get together. Miss Bilchmartner, you're a meter maid, is that correct? Yes. Do you do windows? No, of course not. What kind of maid are you? Then we have, well, let's move into the Mindy and Buttons one, which this is, um, this is, I think, one of the stronger Mindy, Mindy and Buttons, actually. Uh, Cat on a Hot Steel Bean. Yeah, I, I think it's, uh, I think of the first batch, it's, it's the best. And uh, this was... Uh, Probably because Barry Caldwell, like, literally lived with this thing for a couple of months. He really uh, broke his back on it. Uh, Barry Caldwell being one of the directors and, and storyboard artists on, on the show and on Tiny Toons. He was big, too. But uh, this one, he really, uh, he wrote it, he, he boarded it, he directed it, and uh, he had some help on it with Greg Raina. Uh, but it's really a great accomplishment. And it also has some great little references to cartoons where people or characters would walk on skyscrapers <laughs> under construction. There's like Popeye references, uh, Sweet Pea references. Um, I think there's some other characters. Tom and Jerry, I think, is yeah. in there. Tom mm-hmm. and Jerry come running in. Yeah. Um, and the Warners, of course, go a racing past. Uh, one of the weird moments is that this uh, Mindy, who is uh, basically roped to a tree in her yard, <laughs> which is like, you know, when I think about it, it's got to be against the law. But uh, she's got a bungee cord that, that Barry really uh, stretches to its outer limits because uh, she's like flying around like a, like a, like a airplane on this bungee cord. Um but the kitty comes by, she follows the kitty, she gets out of the bungee, and uh, then, then Buttons is off to the races. He's got to catch up with this this kid who's the luckiest kid on earth, uh, missing all sorts of tragic accidents. While Buttons, uh, of course, that's the whole point of the cartoon. Uh, Buttons, of course, uh, saves her each time, but gets annihilated in the process. Um, that's, that's Mindy and Buttons in a nutshell. And that and, uh, yeah, that kitten I think is from Looney Tunes. I forget the exact episode, but it's like the uh, bulldog and the the kitten is like a you know the bulldog's trying to protect the little kit, black kitten or something. So I think it's I, a famous Chuck Jones cartoon. Yeah, mm-hmm. and uh, it's the most adorable kitten, and uh, it's like Julius or I forget the dog's name, but yeah, the dog's in love with it, and the, the little kitty 
uh, paws needs uh, his fur, and he, it hurts, but he likes the cat and lets it sleep on his back. <laughs> It is. It's that that uh, model was used for this beautiful, cute kitten. Um, and there's also some brilliant backgrounds in this one, down shots of uh, really vertigo-inducing down shots from the heights of this skyscraper down to, toward the ground below. And all the way up to the moon, in fact, or something like that. <laughs> yeah, that builds really up. all the way. And uh, <laughs> Buttons is hammering and building and then we go and we see marvin martian on the moon i mean wild <laughs> uh there's also a caricature uh i think the reporter is a caricature of one of our staff members named steve don meyer well i i think this may be the only time we hear mindy's father speak in the series it's oh. a rare appearance i think i think there's i want to say there's one or two but this is definitely rare. He, he, the father is not. We think the mom is a bad mother, but you want to talk about abs- <laughs> absentee yeah, parents? Yeah, always the dad is. Who knows where he is all the time? I don't know. This is one of the few times that people actually care that Mindy's in trouble. Like people uh, yeah. in the you know real life are like, oh my gosh, there's a baby like really high up in a place she she should not be. Usually people are just like, oh, there's a baby. <laughs> little girl like whatever yeah and and her whole whole exchange with the uh the construction workers how you know why why you know i'm eating lunch why because we're hungry why (laughs) um so anyway frank welker did the uh voice on the dad and uh of course uh tress has always been mindy's mom in all the different episodes hi hi what's it doing eating lunch why? Because it's lunchtime. Why? Because we worked real hard all morning. Why? You got me, kid. Okay, I love you. Bye-bye. Well, let's go to episode 15. And now we're going... We're getting, we're getting off the planet for this one. Because it's a very space-themed episode. We have Space Probed and then Battle for the Planet. So Pinky and the Brain come back for this one. Yeah, this is a this is a really nice little. Uh, this, the first one's you know real sci-fi, uh, and in the second one, the pink and the brain are trying to create the illusion of sci-fi and fail miserably. But uh, this thing was uh, written by uh, John McCann, and I, I just think it's one of his uh, greatest efforts uh, vis-a-vis the Warners. Uh, the episode starts with. Uh, uh, the half hour starts with uh, instead of uh, here's the show's naming, it's wacko in space saying Andromeda Strainy. And uh, so, uh, and also we get a tower, uh, uh, water tower escape in this one, which is uh, a circus cannon, and they're like human cannonballs that shoot them out to the front gate. Yeah, these are really fantastic anim- animated uh, sequences, too. These escapes that with the whether it's the bubble or the the uh. The, the cannon stuff like that, and of course later on, I think I think it's in this episode they actually start going back into the the, the tower as well. And they, yeah, they do. That's right. They're, and it, it, these were uh, really laid out and animated by Rich Aaron's and Rusty Mills, and then uh, TMS did a beautiful job on them. Uh, but this particular cartoon, um, uh, uh, Space Probe, was uh, done by. Tokyo uh, by uh, excuse me by Cuckoo's Nest uh, Wang Films uh, with, again with Dave Marshall over there, Gary Hartle and Rich Aaron are directors on this, but it's a very very funny script. And what I love about uh, what Dave and, and Wang and Cuckoo's Nest bring to the Warners is they really know how to make the Warners look as cute as ever. I mean, they're mm. they're always cute in uh, Cuckoo Nest cartoons and in. Uh, Star Tunes cartoons. They're really, really cute. They're beautifully animated in TMS cartoons, but not quite as cute. It's the way they do their eyelids and their chubby little cheeks. They're just adorable. And uh, I also like Jim Cummings as uh, the toe. Oh, he does gosh. The, of the toe in this. Bring me a Q-tip. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, the, who could have thought a toe could be so disgusting, you know? Just that was really... Do my cuticles. <laughs> uh, um, 
and that, I mean, they, this is this is a fun one because the aliens really don't know what to do. I mean, if an alien came to Earth and met the Warners, what would they do? Well, they pretty much do what they do in this cartoon. They wouldn't know what to do with these guys. They, they're trying to probe these characters. They're trying to, you know, get at what human beings are like. And, of course, the Warners are anything but normal human beings. So uh, they don't know. They're getting lifted up. They don't know if they're going to be examined or dry cleaned. I love that one. <laughs> <laughs> Inspect their bodies. Excuse me. I think I should warn you. We've eaten within the last 24 hours. Look, it's Big Fat Scotty from Star Trek. Whoa, that'll leave a mark. Really? Hey, listen, Yoda, why are you recuperating? You mind if we take a look around? Maybe play a game of tag? Yeah. Hey, thanks! Oh, by the way, tag, you're it! Well, Kelly, let's just, just to humor me, Kelly, what's your favorite part in this cartoon? They call him Yoda. They do call him Yoda, and it, it, yeah, <laughs> and it's... And consistently, they never give it up. Yakko <laughs> is convinced the guy is Yoda. <laughs> I love that they run in, they're running all around the ship and they run into a room where they find Elvis and Bigfoot and Jimmy Hoffa and Amelia Earhart. <laughs> and get out of here. We don't want to be bothered. <laughs> uh, yeah, good deal. And in so many sci fi parodies, you're just kind of like jammed into here. We have, you know, aliens and uh, then you have you know, even Star Wars and Star Trek characters and the Jetsons and and just it's just jammed full with little uh, quick. It is jammed full. That Jetsons bit is great. Jane stuff is crazy. Them. Oh, this is the one. <laughs> this is the cartoon where the Warners see the subtitles and react yes, to them, yep. move the words around to get what they need. Are uh, these typical human creatures or something? Earth <laughs> yes, Are these yeah. typical Earth creatures? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I jotted down some of the cameos. Pinky and the Brain are a cameo. They're in cages. Mel Gibson, uh, Marvin the Martian, uh, Picard from the Star, Tre- Star uh, Trek, Darth Vader's in there. Uh, the Jane Jetson bit stopped this crazy thing. Um, and even Hello Nurse shows up. Oh, that's yes. What the, yeah, Yakko wishes for her. <laughs> and By the way, Yoda was played by Mo, in case you were wondering how. Yes. Did, did you know that with Mo? You probably did. Yes. Maurice LaMarche for everybody who's not <laughs> <laughs> used to nicknames. Uh, yeah. Wait, it, speaking of, of, of Maurice's nickname, is that, how did, how did, do you have any idea how it, he's called Mo? Like how that came around? Just, he says, call me Mo, or how, how'd you find that? <laughs> I think Mo is a, uh, and I could be wrong. Uh, you know how I, ri- people named Richard are sometimes called Dick? Uh huh. I think Maurice. It's like, do you know that people, na- women named Margaret, are sometimes called what? Peggy. 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 And now, what? How does that make sense? Yeah, I don't know. So, I think Maurice. I think Mo is a typical Maurice. I mean, okay, okay. I think maybe Mo of the Three Stooges might be uh, a more a Maurice, but Perhaps. I could be wrong. I don't know. Okay. Something. I'm probably wrong on that. <laughs> Wow, I'm not as good as you, Yoda. See you later. Yoda, Let's go to the uh, the War of the Worlds one then. The the uh, parody of this. So this is Battle for the Planet. Just taking the yes. synonyms of War of the Worlds <laughs> and putting yes. Battle for the Planet. Yeah, this is uh, uh, an early Pinky in the Brain. Very early. Uh, uh, Peter and uh, Alfred Germano directing. Peter writing. Um, very much a, a, a direct sort of uh, not a parody, but almost like taking the the plot, uh, the, the the news that this happened as a radio show years and years ago. That uh, Orson Welles did this uh, War of the Worlds performance on the radio, and that it freaked out people around the country, including my uncle, by the way, my. <laughs> Uh, my uncle Richie was listening, and he really he and he they lived in New Jersey, and uh, the the broadcast Grover's Mill, New Grover Mills, New Jersey, was where the aliens had landed and were annihilating people. 
Well, he was listening to this and really got freaked out. Oh, I mean, no. He didn't, go, he didn't go running, but he, he had missed the uh, earlier disclaimer, so it was mm. pretty freaky. Um, also, this is such an early episode of Pinky the Brain, and there are other early ones, but Pinky's voice is lower in this one. Yeah, I noticed yeah. that. Uh, uh, so we're still finding our, our voice on this. Uh, I like that um, Brain calls television the great deceptor. <laughs> <laughs> Why would they be scared of us? We're so small and we're practically the size of mice, Brain. We are mice, Pinky. Oh, right. Well, there you are then. <laughs> it's not a question of size, Pinky. It's a question of scale. Watch the monitor. <laughs> Zounds, Brain! You're gigantic! Television, Pinky. The Great Deceptor. No. But how, how appropriate that Orson Welles, of course, uh, you know, was behind War of the Worlds, and now we have the brain. Yeah. Right with a very Orson Welles-ish performance. You wonder if Brain actually heard the uh, thing. He's like, that sounds like me. <laughs> that's, that's a great right. idea. That guy sounds just like me. <laughs> we should have done that. That's, that should have been it. Well, later on when we did, uh, we did the Third Man parody, uh, where Brain played basically Orson Welles' character in that cartoon. Um, now, in this cartoon, I noticed a couple of caricatures. Uh, w- one was in a control room. The animator from the first episode of Tiny Toons was one of the control room uh, technicians. Oh, okay. And uh, Katie Kaboom's parents and her and Katie Kaboom's son. They look like they're the one, the family watching TV uh, as we, like the sample of American people watching it. Yeah, jumping they, back, you know, now that you mention it, even in La La La, there's like those similar characters that you see, like Elmira's parents or something like that, or, or like in there, in the jury box or something weird like that. Yeah, but when the, uh, when the design artist uh, for the characters was running out of time, you would... You'd go through the pile. Hmm, this could work. Yes. <laughs> I like Pinky as an alien just wearing a glove. I think that's pretty good. Yes. Uh, what else do we know about this one? Well, it, you know, I, I was thinking last night, it, at the very end of it, of course, everybody is, uh, they just laugh and the newspaper says, it's such a hit. And, every, you know, this is the show to see. And it really almost felt it like, like Mel Brooks, the producers or something like, you know, they hit a springtime mm. for Hitler offensive show in mind. And instead everybody laughs at them and just thinks it's a great show to watch. So, and this is a, and as you guys, I think we've talked about this before. One of the most difficult things to achieve uh, in any kind of entertainment is when in the story, you say you tell the audience this thing is really funny and as we're doing here we're saying this was so funny that the the world you know laughed uh, no one was worried it was so funny the world just thought it was laughing they want us they want this kind of thing because it's so fun but if it's not that funny it's like eh, i don't know uh, <laughs> so, yeah so that's why uh you really never want to get into this the, the situation where you're you're saying the show you're going to see coming up is really funny. Uh, <laughs> if it isn't, you're you're a liar. Yeah. So that's the only problem. People are like, "Oh yeah, try me." <laughs> yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so that's where we're going to be stopping for today. Make sure to listen to next week for part two. And if you haven't listened to uh, Tom, by the way, speaking about episodes one through ten of uh, Animaniacs with us. Uh, That just happened a couple months ago, so check out Animaniacast.com, or if you're subscribed to this podcast, just go back a few episodes and you'll be able to find that as well. It's uh, it's, it's information you're not going to find anywhere else, I think. In the meantime, you can also go ahead and get on Twitter and follow Nathan. He's at DjangoFD on Twitter and Kelly is at Yoda Princess that's Y-O-D-A P-R-N-C-S-S and follow Tom Ruger he's on Twitter he's at Tom Ruger also on Facebook and Instagram and check out Tom's blog that's cartoonatics.blogspot.com 
As for the Animaniacast, make sure you can like us on Facebook. You can follow us on Instagram, on Twitter, and subscribe to the Animaniacast on your favorite podcast player so you never miss an episode. And while you're on your podcast player, why don't you go ahead and subscribe to the RetroZap feed as well. That way you can listen to this podcast and all of the other RetroZap podcasts so you can stay informed and entertained with Star Wars stuff and video games and collecting, uh, movies, uh, really everything else pop culture related. Uh, And hey, check out RetroZap.com every day for amazing articles and podcast posts each day of the week. We're a proud member of the RetroZap.com family, and you can actually talk to us on Discord. You can get a welcome link to the RetroZap group by simply going to discord.animaniacast.com and all of you Discord users can uh, have uh, discourse with us. Well, that'll do it for this week. So, for Nathan, Kelly, and Tom, this is Joey saying, we'll see you next week, and good night, everybody! This podcast is not endorsed by Warner Brothers or Amblin Entertainment, and is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Animaniacs, Tiny Toon Adventures, Freakazoid, the Warner Brothers logo, all names, pictures, and sounds are registered trademarks and or copyrights of their respective trademark and copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of the Animaniacast, unless otherwise indicated.